Welcome to the Thousand Nights and One Night. Now, when it was the 46th night, she said, it hath reached me, O auspicious king, that after the ambassadors and retinue from the Constantinople king had kissed the ground before Armar and had delivered their embassage, they brought out the presents, which were 50 damsels of the choicest from Graceland and 50 Mamelukes in tunics of brocade, belted with girdles of gold and silver, each wearing in his ears hoops of gold with pendants of fine pearls, costing a thousand ducats each one. The girls were adorned in like fashion and were clad in stuffs worth a treasury of money. When the king saw them, he rejoiced in them and accepted them and bade the ambassadors to honorably entreated and summoning his wazirs, took counsel with them of what he should do. Herewith rose up among them a wazir, an ancient man, Dandan Height, who kissed the ground before Omar and said, O king, there is nothing better to do in this matter than equip an army valiant and victorious and set over it thy son Sharhakan with us and his lieutenants. And this reed commended itself to me on two counts. First, because the king of Rome <coughs> hath invoked thine assistance and hath sent thee gifts which thou hast accepted. And secondly, because while no enemy dareth attack our country, thine army may go forth safely and should be succor. The king of Graceland and the defeat his foe, the glory will be thine. Moreover, the news of it will be noised abroad in all cities and countries, and especially when the tidings shall reach the islands of the ocean, and the king of Maritania shall hear it, and they will send thee offerings of rarities and pay thee tribute of money. The king, pleased by the wazir's word, and approving his reed, gave him a dress of honor and said to him, Of the like of thee should king, kings ask counsel, and it seemeth fit that thou shouldest conduct the van of our army, on our son Sharkhan, command the main battle. Then he sent for his son, who came and kissed the ground before him and sat down. And he expounded to him the matter, telling him what the ambassadors and the wazir Dandan had said. And he charged him to take arms and equip himself for the campaign, enjoying him not to gainsay Dandan and aught he should do. Moreover, he ordered him to pick out his army, 10,000 horsemen, armed cap a -pie, and inured to onset and stress of war. Accordingly, Shah Khan arose on the instant and chose out a myriad of horsemen, after which he entered his palace and mustered his host and distributed largesse to them, saying, Ye have delay of three days. They kissed the earth before him in obedience to his commands and began at once to lay in munitions and provide provisions for the occasion, while Shah Khan repaired to the armories and took therewith whatsoever he required of arms and armor and thence to the stable where he chose horses of choice blood and others. When the appointed three days were ended, the army drew out to the suburbs of Baghdad city, and King Omar came forth to take leave of his son, who kissed the ground before him and received from the king seven parcels of money. Then he turned to Dandan and commented to his care the army of his son, and the wazir kissed the ground before him and answered, I hear and obey. And lastly, he charged Shah that he should consult the wazir on all occasions, which he promised to do. After this, the king returned to his city, and Shah Khan ordered the officers to muster their troops in battle array. So they mustered them, and their number was 10,000 horsemen, besides footmen and camp followers. Then they loaded their baggage on their beasts, and the war drums beat, and the trumpets blared, and the bannerals and standards were unfurled by Shah Khan mounted horse with the wazir Dandan by his side, and the colors fluttering over their heads. So the host fared forth, and stinted not faring with the ambassadors preceding them, till day departed and night drew nigh, when they alighted and encamped for the night. And as soon as Allah caused the moon to morrow, they mounted and hied on guided by the ambassadors for a space of twenty days. And by the night of the twenty-first, they came to a fine and spacious weighty, well-grown with trees and shrubbery. 
Here Shara Khan ordered them to alight and commanded a three days halt. So they dismounted and pitched their tents, spreading their camp over the right and left slopes of the extensive valley. Whilst the wazir Dandan and the ambassadors of King Afridan pitched in the soul of the waiting. As for Shara Khan, he tarried behind them a while till all had dismounted and had dispersed themselves over the valley sides. He then slacked the reins of his steed, being minded to explore the weighty and to mount guard in his own person because of his father's charge. And owing to the fact that they were on the frontier of Gracieland and on the enemy's country, so he rode out alone after ordering his armed slaves and his bodyguard to camp near the wazir Dandan, and he fared on along the side of the valley till a fourth part of the night was passed, when he felt tired and drowsiness overcame him so that he could no longer urge horse with heel. Now he was accustomed to take rest on horseback, so when slumber overpowered him, he slept, and the, seat, the steed ceased not going on with him till half the night was spent, and entered one of the thickets which was dense with growth. But Shah Khan awoke not until his horse stumbled over wooded ground. Then he started from sleep and found himself among the trees. And the moon arose and shone brightly over the two horizons, eastern and western. He was startled when he found himself alone in this place and said the say which ne'er yet shamed its sayer. There is no majesty and there is no might save in Allah, the glorious and the great. But as he rode on in fear of wild beasts, behold, the moon spread her glad light over a meadow as it were of the meads of paradise. And he heard pleasant voices and a loud noise of talk and laughter, captivating the senses of men. So King Shara Khan alighted and tying his steed to one of the trees, went over a little way till he came upon a stream and heard a woman calling in Arabic and saying, Now, by the word, I will throw her and truss her up with her own girdle. He kept walking in the direction of the sound. When he reached the further side, he looked and beheld a stream was gushing and flowing and antelopes at large were frisking and roving and wild cattle amid the pasture moving and birds expressed joy and gladness in their diverse tongue. And that place was purpled with all manner flowers and green herbs. And as Shah Khan considered the place, he saw in it a Christian monastery within whose castle towered high in the air, catching the light of the moon. Through the midst of the convent passed a stream, the water flowing amongst its gardens, and upon the bank sat the woman whose voice he had heard, while before her stood ten maidens like moon and wearing various sorts of raiment and ornaments that dazed and dazzled the beholder high bosom virgins. Shah Khan gazed upon the ten girls and saw in their midst a lady like the moon at fullest with ringletted hair and forehead, sheeny white and eyes wondrous wide and black and bright and temple locks like the scorpion's tail. And she was perfect in essence and attributes as the poet said of her in these couplets. She beamed on my sight with a wondrous glance, and her straight, slender stature is shamed the lance. She burst on my sight with cheeks, rosy red, where all the manner of beauties have habitats, and the locks of her forehead were lowering as night whence issues a dawn tide of happiest chance. Then Shah Khan heard her say to the handmaids, Come ye on that I may wrestle with you and gravel you ere the moon set and the dawn break. So each came up to her in turn, and she grounded them forthright, and pinioned them with their girdles, and ceased not wrestling, and pitching them until she had overthrown one and all. Then she turned to her, an old woman, who was before her, and the bedlam said as in wrath, O oh, strumpet, dost thou glory in grounding these girls? Behold, I am an old woman, yet have I thrown them forty times. So what hast thou to boast of? But... If thou have the strength to wrestle with me, stand up, that I may grip thee and set thy head between thy heels. The young lady smiled at her words, but she was filled with inward wrath, and she jumped up and asked, O oh, my lady, Zat Adwali, 
by the truth of the Messiah, wilt thou wrestle with me in very deed, or dost thou jest with me? And she answered, Yea. And Shaharazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. Now, when it was the forty-seventh night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the young lady asked Sat ad Dwali, by the truth of the Messiah wilt wrestle with me or dost jest? And she answered, Yea, I will wrestle with thee in very deed. Shere Khan looking on all the while. The damsel cried, Rise up from the fall, and thou have spunk so to do. When the old woman heard this, she raged with exceeding rage, and her body hair stood on end like the bristles of a fretful hedgehog. Then she sprang to her feet, whilst the damsel stood up to her and said, now, by the truth of the Messiah, I will not wrestle with thee unless I be naked, mistress whore. So she loosed her petticoat trousers, and putting her hand under her clothes, tore them off her body, then twisted up a silken kerchief into a cord shape, girded around her middle, and became as she were a scald head Ifrida, or a spotted snake. With this she inclined towards the damsel and said, do thou as I have done. All this time, Shere Khan was gazing at the twain and laughing at the bedlam's loathy semblance. So the damsel leisurely rose and taking a sash of Yamani stuff, passed it twice around her waist, and then she tucked up her trousers and displayed two calves of alabaster, carrying a mound of crystal, smooth and rounded, and a stomach which exhaled musks from its dimples as it were a bed of new almonds and enemies and breasts like double pomegranates. Then the woman leaned towards her and the two laid hold each of the other while Shara Khan raised his head heavenwards and prayed Allah that the bell might beat the bedlam. Presently the young woman got beneath the old woman and gripping her waistcloth with the left and circling her neck with the right hand hoisted her off the ground with both, whereupon the old woman strove to free herself, and in so doing fell on her back with her legs high in the air, and her hair bush between them showed manifest in the moonshine. Furthermore, she let fly two great farts, which blew up the dust from the earth's face, and the other streamed up to the gate of heaven. Shar Khan laughed till he fell back upon the ground. Then he arose, and bearing his brand, looked right and left, but he saw no one save the old woman sprawling on her back, and said to himself, He lied not who named thee Lady of Calamities. Verily thou knewest her prowess by her performance upon the others. So he drew near to hear what should pass between them. Then the young lady went up to the old one, and throwing a wrapper of thin silk upon her nakedness, helped her to don her clothes, and made excuses, saying, O oh, my lady Zatadwali, I intended only to throw thee not all this, but thou triest to twist out of my hands, so laud to Allah for thy safety. <laughs> she returned her no answer, but rose in her shame, and walked away till out of sight, leaving the handmaids prostrate and pinioned with the fair maiden standing amongst them. Quoth Shah Khan to himself, Every luck hath its cause. Sleep did not fall upon me, nor the war horse bear me hither save for my good fortune, for doubtless this maid and what is with her shall become booty to me. So he made towards his steed and mounted and healed him on, when he sped as the shaft speeds from the bow, and in his hand he still hent his brand bare of sheath, which he brandished, shouting the while his war cry, Allah is almighty! When the damsel saw him, she sprang to her feet, and taking from stand on the bank of the stream, whose breath was six eels, the normal cubits made, one bound and landed clear on the farther side, where she turned and cried out with a loud voice, Who art thou, O thou fellow that breakest in upon our privacy and pastime, and that to hanger in hand as if charging a host? Whence came thou, and whither art thou going? Speak sooth, for truth will stand thee in good stead, and lie not, for lies come of villain breed. Doubtless thou hast wandered this night from thy way, 
that thou might chances upon this place was escape were the greatest of mercies. For art thou now in an open plain? And did we shout, but a single shout would come to our rescue four thousand knights. So tell me what thou wantest. And if thou wouldst only have us set thee on the right road, we will do so. When Shara Khan heard her words, he replied, I am a stranger of the Moslems who fared forth this night, single-handed, seeking for spoil. Nor could this moonlight show me a fairer booty than these ten maidens. So I shall seize them and rejoin my comrades with them. Quoth she, I would have known that as for the booty, thou hast not come at it. And as for the handmaids, by Allah, they shall never be thy spoil. Have I not told thee that to lie is villain file? Quoth he, the wise man is he who taketh warning by others. Thereupon, quoth she, by the hand of the Messiah, I do not fear that thy death would be on my hands. I would shout a shout, should fill up the mead for thee with war steeds and with men of might, but I take pity upon the stranger. So if thou sink booty, I require of thee that thou alight from thy steed and swear to me by thy faith that thou wilt not advance against me aught like arms and hand, and we will wrestle, I and thou. And if thou throw me, set me on thy steed, and take all of us as thy booty. Then if I throw thee, thou shalt become under my command. Swear this to me, for I fear thy treachery. Indeed, it hath become a common saw, wherein periphery is innate, their trust is a weakly mate. Now, and thou wilt swear, I will return and draw near to thee and tackle thee. Answered Shara Khan, and indeed he lusted to seize her, and said in his soul, Truly she knoweth not that I am a champion of champions. Swear me by the, what oath thou wilt, and by thou deemest most binding, and I will not approach thee with aught till thou hast made thy preparation, and sayest, Draw near that I wrestle with thee. If thou throw me, I have money wherewithal to ransom myself, and if I throw thee, twill be booty and booty enough for me, <laughs> rejoined the damsel. I am content herewith. And Shara Khan was astounded at her words, and said, And by the truth of the apostle, whom Allah bless and keep, I too am content on the other part. Then said she, Swear to me by him whose right in body died and dealt laws to rule mankind aright, that thou wilt not offer me aught of violence save by way of wrestling, else mayest thou die without the pale of all Islam. Shere Khan replied, By Allah, were a Khazir to swear me, even though he were a Khazi, of the Khazis, he would not impose upon me such an oath as this. Then he swore to her by all she named, and tied his steed to a tree. But he was drowned in the sea of thought, saying in himself, Praise be to him, who fashioned her from dirty water. Then he girt himself and made ready for wrestling and said to her, Cross the stream to me. But she replied, It is not for me to come over to thee, if thou wilt pass thou over here to me. I cannot do that, quoth he. And quoth she, O oh boy, I will come across to thee. So she tucked up her skirts and leaping, landed on the other side of the stream by his side, whereupon he drew near to her and bent him forwards and clapped palms. But he was confounded by her beauty and loveliness, for he saw a shape with the hand of power had tanned with dye leaves of the john, which had been fostered by the hand of benefits, and fanned by the zephyrs of fair fortune, and whose birth at propitious assent ad greeted. Then she called out to him, O Moslem, come on and let us wrestle ere the break of morning and tucked up her sleeves from a forearm like fresh curd, which illumined the whole place with its whiteness, and Shar Khan was dazzled by it. Then he stood forwards and clapped his palms by the way of challenge, she doing the like, and caught hold of her, and the two grappled and gripped in interlocked hands and arms. Presently she shifted his hands to her slender waist, when his fingertips sank into the soft folds of her middle, breathing anguishment, he fell a trembling like the Persian reed in the roaring gale. So she lifted him up and throwing him to the ground, sat upon his breast with hips and hinder cheeks like mounds of sand where his soul had lost mastery over his senses. 
And she asked him, O Moslem, the slaying of Nazarenes is lawful to you folk. What then hast thou to say about being slain thyself? And he answered, O my lady, thy speech as regards slaying me is not other than unlawful for our prophet Muhammad, who Allah bless and preserve, prohibited the slaying of women and children, old men and monks. As it was thus revealed to your prophet, she replied, it behoveth us to render the equivalent of his mercy. So rise, I give thee thy life for generosity is never lost upon the generous. Then she got off his breast and he rose and stood shaking the dust from his head against the owners of the curved rib, even woman. And she said to him, be not ashamed, but verily one who entereth the land of room in quest of booty and cometh to assist kings after kings. How happeneth if thou, <coughs> he hath not strengthened enough to defend himself from one made out of the curved rib? Twas not for the lack of strength in me, he answered nor didst thou throw me by thy force. It was thy loveliness overthrew me. So if thou wilt grant me another bout, it will be of thy courtesy. She laughed and said, I grant thee thy request, but these handmaids have long been pinioned and their arms and sides are weary. And it were only right I should loose them, for happily this next wrestling bout will be long. Then she went to the slave girls and unbinding them said to them in the tongue of Greece, Get ye to some safe place till I foil this Moslem's lust and longing for you. So they went away, while Shara Khan kept gazing at them, and they kept looking at the two of them. Then each approached the adversary, and he set his breast against hers. But when he felt waist touch waist, his strength failed him. And she, waxing aware of this, lifted him with her hands swiftly, then the blinding love and flash, and threw him to the ground. He fell on his back, and then she said to him, Rise, I give thee thy life a second time. I spared thee in the first count because of thy prophet, for that he made unlawful the slaying of women. I do so on the second count because of thy weakliness and greenness of thine years and thy strangerhood. But I charge thee, if there be in the Muslim army sent by Omar, by Omar bin al Nu'uman to Sukkar, the king of Constantinople, a stronger than thou, send him hither and tell him of me, for in wrestling there are shifts and trips, catches and holes, such as the feint or falsing, and the snap or poor grip, the hug, the feet catching, the thigh bite, the jostle, the leg lock. Oh, by Allah, O oh my lady, quoth Shah Rukh Khan. Indeed, he was highly incensed against her. Had I been Master Al Safdi, Master Mohammed Kimmel, or Ibn Asadi, as they were in their prime, I have kept no note of these shifts thou mentionest. For, O oh my mistress, by Allah, thou hast not grasped me by thy strength, but by the blandishments of thy back parts. For we men of Mesopotamia so love a full form thigh that no sense was left me for foresight. And now, as thou wish, Thou shalt try a third fall with me while my wits are about me. And this last match is allowed me by the laws of the game, which saith the best of three. Moreover, I have regained my presence of mind. When she heard his words, she said to him, Hast thou not had a belly full of this wrestling, O vanquished one? However, come on, and thou wilt but know that this must be the last round. Then she bent forward and challenged him, and Shah Rukh Khan did likewise, setting to it in real earnest and being right cautious about the throw. So the two strove a while, and the damsel found in him a strength such as she had not observed before, and said to him, O Moslem, thou art now on thy mettle. Yes, he replied, thou knowest that there remaineth to me but this one round after which each of us will wend a different way. She laughed, and he laughed too. Then she overreached at his thigh and caught firm hold of it unawares which made him greet the ground and fall full on his back she laughed at him and said art thou an eater of bran thou art like a bodwise bonnet which falleth off with every touch or, or else the father of winds that droppeth before a puff of air fie upon thee O thou poor thing adding Get thee back to the Moslem army, and send us other than thyself, for thou failest of Thus, and proclaim for us among the Arabs and Persians, the Turks and the Damalites, 
whoso hath might in him, let him come to us. Then she made a spring and landed on the other side of the stream and said to Sharakhan, laughing, Parting with thee is right grievous to me, O my lord, but get thee to thy mates before dawn, lest the knights come upon thee and pick thee up with their lance points. Thou hast no strength to defend thee against a woman, so how couldst thou hold thine own among men of might and knights? Sharkon was confounded and called to her as she turned from him, making towards the convent. O oh, my lady, wilt thou go away and leave the miserable stranger, the broken-hearted slave of love? So she turned to him, laughing, and said, What is thy want? I will grant thee thy prayer. Have I set foot in thy country and tasted the sweetness of thy courtesy, replied he? And shall I return without eating of thy victuals and tasting thy hospitality, I who have become one of thy servitors? None but kindness save the base, she rejoined. Honor us in Allah's name, on my head and eyes be it. Now thy steed, and ride along the brink of the stream over against me, for now thou art my guest. At this, Shah Khan was glad, and hastening back to his horse, mounted and walked him abreast of her, and she kept faring on till they came to a drawbridge, built of beams of the white poplar, hung by pulleys and steel chains, and made fast with hooks and padlocks. When Shah Khan looked, he saw waiting her upon the bridge the same ten handmaids whom she had thrown in the wrestling bouts, and as she came up to them, she said one in the Greek tongue, Arise! and take the reins of his horde, and conduct him across to the convent. So she went up to Sharkon, and led him over much puzzled and perturbed with what he saw, and saying to himself, oh, Would that the wazir Dandan were here with me, that his eyes might look upon these fairest of favors. Then he turned to the young lady, and said to her, O oh, marvel of loveliness, now I have two claims upon thee, first the claim of good fellowship, and secondly, for thou hast carried me to thy home and offered me thy hospitality. I am now under thy commandments and thy guidance. So do me one last favor by accompanying me to the lands of all Islam, where thou shalt look upon many a lion-hearted warrior, and thou shalt learn who I am. When she heard this, she was angered and said to him, By the truth of Messiah, thou hast proved thyself with me a man of keen wit, and now I see what mischief there is in thy heart, and how thou canst permit thyself a speech, which proveth thy traitorous intent. How should I do as thou sayest, when I wot that I came to that king of yours, Omar bin al Nu'uman? I should never get free from him, for truly he hath not the like of me, or, or behind his city walls, or within the palace halls, lord of Baghdad, and of Khorasan, though he be, who hath built for himself twelve pavilions in numbers as the months of the year, and in each a concubine after the number of the days. And if I come to him, he would not prove shy of me, for your folk belief. I am lawful to have and to hold as is set in your writ, or those women whom your right hand shall possess as slaves. So how canst thou speak thus to me? As for thy saying, thou shalt look upon the braves of the Moslems by the truth of the Messiah, Thou sayest that which is not true, for I saw your army when it reached our land these two days ago, and I did not see that your ordinance was the ordinance of kings, but I beheld only a rabble of tribesmen gathered together. As to thy words, thou shalt know who I am. I did not do thee kindness because of thy dignity, but out of pride in myself, and the like of thee should not talk thus to the like of me, even were thou Shah Khan Omar bin Anu'uman's son. The prowess name is in these days. Knowest thou Shah Khan? asked he. And she answered, Yes, and I know of his coming with an armory numbering ten thousand horsemen. Also that he was sent by his sire with this force to gain prevalence for the king of Constantinople. O oh, my lady, said Shah Khan, I adjure thee by thy religion. Tell me the cause of all this, that sooth may appear to me clear of untruth, and whom the fault lies. Now by the virtue of thy faith, she replied, did I not fear lest the news of me be brooded about that I am the, of the daughters of Rome, would adventure myself and sally forth single-handed against the ten thousand horsemen, and slay their leader, the wazir Dandan, and vanquish their champion, Shah Rukh Khan? Nor would aught of shame accrue to me thereby, 
for I have read books and studied the rules of good breeding in the language of the Arabs, but I have no need to vaunt my own prowess to thee, nor by tokens as thou hast proved in thy proper person my skill in the strength of wrestling, and thou hast learned my superiority over other women. Nor indeed has Shah Khan himself been here this night, and it were said to him, Play the stream. Could he have done it? And I only long and lust that the Messiah would throw him into my hands in this very convent, that I might go forth to him in the habit of a man, and drag him from his saddle seat, and make him my captain, and lay him in bilbos. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her, her permitted say. And so do I cease my say for this day, until it be morrow.